You're listening to a Claire FM podcast. Morning Focus broadcasts weekdays from 9 a.m. to 12 midday. Like so many people, my next guest spent a period of time contending with the costs of living in Dublin. And like a good few of them, he's decided to swap that for what I hope was a more peaceful and serene life back west. Moving from Dublin to Lahinch, Rory McKiernan is a charity founder. He is a campaigner. He's a podcaster. He's been on the council estate and plenty more as well. And it's a real pleasure to welcome in studio. Rory, good morning to you. Good morning, Gavin. Thanks How are you for, I'm very good. And thanks for joining us. And welcome to Claire. Thanks very much. Uh, to yourself and Susan, your wife, you've moved down to La Hinch and joined we us? We are indeed. We're in the La Hinch area at the moment and really, really enjoying it. And uh, I have to say, like, genuinely, the welcome has been amazing. Um, I'd have a little bit of trepidation of being a blow-in. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm always conscious that you don't want to spoil the party. Um, but thankfully, it, it does genuinely feel that Clare people are very welcoming and uh, it's, it's great to see that. Sure. And there, there seems to be a, a lot of blow-ins in the county, <laughs> but we need to make sure the Clare people still That's rule the roost. <laughs> Clare people will look out that 48% of people in Clare were not born in Clare. Is that That's right? That's a census wow, figure. Yeah. That's one I like to trot out every now and then. So you are by no means yeah. on your own in, in, yeah. in choosing to make this place your home. Um, and, and you're very more welcome and delighted that you're uh, enjoying it and settling in. We'll talk about that in a second. I know you best as being the founder of Spun Out, uh, a national youth organisation which has kind of looked after uh, mental health and other areas as well and looking after after youth and, and that sort of stuff. That would be your main area, the fridge? Yeah, I'd say youth and community uh, activism or action or youth development has been my main work over the last 17 years. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago I, I set up uh, Spun Out at the time I was living in Donegal. I was working for the health service. Um, I originally studied business at university and I'd always be keen to say to young folk that are going to college or deciding their choices that what they do isn't necessarily what they w- will end up doing. So for me, my interests and passions ended up being around, uh, I suppose, trying to make the world a better place. Uh, I would say that I'm an idealist and uh, I don't shy away from that, that I I do aspire to see a better world, a better country and better communities and to try and play my part in that. And I was very, very fortunate that I realised that when I was younger and um, I got good mentorship when I was in Donegal and I got people to encourage me to set up an organisation and thankfully it it started to, to go very well. We won awards and the website got up and running, ended up setting up offices and hiring staff and 15 years later the organisation's still running. Mm. I'm no longer with it but it has new fresh energy and younger blood and all the rest. So I went on to do similar work for the last many many number of years and I'm still passionate about championing youth and community uh, change. How do you make a living doing that? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favourite question. (laughs) Let's just say it's not the most lucrative uh, work in the world. It definitely isn't. Mm. Um, It's it's really is vocational. Um, But I do. I get paid. uh, I do consultancy work for um, companies, individuals, and NGOs in around strategy, communications, advocacy. Sure. I help them think better, act better, uh, also save money where possible. But I in in recent years I've started doing mentor and coaching work with individuals so I'll sit with a one, with someone one on one and help them understand where they're at in their life and to be more effective in championing change for themselves and in some ways that's about leadership and it's an area that I'm really passionate about because I think sometimes the culture we grow up with in Ireland is a uh, it can be a humble and a modest one and I think mm. that's to our credit in particular that we're not brash people well most of us aren't anyway in Ireland and um, but I think sometimes we can hold ourselves back and keep ourselves down and play small. And I think that can be to the detriment of the community, to the individual and to the country. And so some of that is about confidence and some of that's about courage. And again, I've been lucky to have people that have championed that and helped me understand that in my own life. So I like to work with individuals in that area. And again, the work is for them to figure out what they want to do. It's not for me to do it. You're but kind of facilitating. A little bit, a little bit, yeah. And then I do a lot of public speak and I go into schools and deliver workshops sure. and so it's a bit of this and that but it's it's for the most part it's really enjoyable It ties, well obviously we all have to make a, a living but it ties that in with your your passions by the sound of it, you still have that overarching goal that was there when you set up Spunout.ie and trying to make a difference and an improvement Yeah, there's still fire in the belly uh, <laughs> you know, as long as there is um change that needs to happen I've signed up to trying to play my small part in it and I don't aspire to be or don't uh, think that I'm the man that's going to do it all it's about all of us doing it together so my main focus is to try and 
work with other people and be part of a community effort for change and I'm lucky that I keep fueling the fire through meeting people that are better than me or wiser than me and one of the ways I do that is through my podcast and I tend to interview quite often they're older folk you know they've been in the trenches for 20 or 30 even 50 years sometimes <laughs> and um you know, my next guest coming up is Christy Moore, and uh, he's someone that I have a lot of respect for, not just musically, but how he's lived in terms of giving up the drink, but staying true to who he is and sure. being a voice for change. And I get a lot of inspiration from from people like that. What's the name of the podcast? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the podcast is called The Love and Courage Podcast. To do the work that you've talked about, though, and I don't mean the podcasting, but the, the advocacy and trying to engender change, do you not need to be close to the decision making? Makers, and are they not in the main in Dublin? Is it going to be harder to continue ah. that from the ancient from the West? Yeah, well, we have the internet, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, contentious issue, and I do think broadband access at this stage in our country is ridiculous, uh, the lack of investment and the poor decision making. Did you in any way? Probably not because you're from Donegal. But uh, you... Well, I'm, I'm actually originally from Cavan, oh, believe sorry, it or not, apologies. which is, in some ways, it can be... Yeah, with Donegal, no, Donegal's worse broadband, I'd say, <laughs> but I'm originally from Cavan, and... Um, but no, I, I've lived a fair bit in rural Ireland. I've lived in Galway for many years and I was only in, really in Dublin for eight years. And those eight years were very fascinating because I did get to kind of press the flesh with all the, the mover shakers and the who's who and what's what. And obviously, as you said, I served with the president on the Council of State for seven years. So mm. I met the Taoiseach and the Taunished and all of that. Um, but for me, the power lies with the people. And I you know, want to be among the people organising for change. Yeah. And it's, but you can and, change know, the people yeah, in front of you, yeah, but if you, if you can change the thinking of a leader, that is a much more... The potential is there for a much bigger impact, surely. Yeah, well, I mean, that's on the assumption that they're, they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think they listen best when we organise in large numbers. And that's something that I've worked with a colleague over the last years, uh, Siobhan O'Donoghue, she's originally from County Clare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was part of the the founding team of Uplift and we now have 180,000 members and we organise through the internet and through petitions, through protests, through campaigns to create change. And that's large numbers of people and there are tens of thousands uh, coming together, not just electronically, but in Mm. in physical terms, going to visit their TD's office and applying pressure that way. But there's any number of ways to affect change and change doesn't always need to be uh, systemic or political. It can be in your local area, and that's just as valid and worthy as well. But if you're looking to make change, and harnessing the internet is an obvious way to reach people, do you then have to battle the perception of having an army of keyboard warriors, of people who will sign petitions because they want change, but maybe not necessarily take that next step of action to, to force it? Yeah, the way I look at that whole debate about online activism, so to speak, is that it's a part of an ecosystem of change. If if somebody just simply doesn't have time in the day, if they have three or four kids and five jobs and they're just under pressure, let's say, and all they have time to do is sign an online petition, that's okay by me, you know. Everyone just do their best. But in two years' time, maybe they get a bit more time on their hands and they decide to take that step to show up to a vigil or a protest Mm. or to write to their TD or phone their TD or run for local election. And that's the (laughs) plug for... I do think we need fresh energy and, and younger folk as well to get out and run for the local elections and there, indeed there, the European election elections. There's an election in North Clare coming up yeah, in, well, in, in May. Uh, well, is this, I, is this a bit, is this? I'll leave, no, no. I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely leave that to the uh, to the Clare people and the people more <laughs> au fait with the, the issues and the matters of, of Clare. You um, could, uh, is politics in the future at some stage perhaps? Uh, uh, look, at the way I see it is like there's politics with the big P in terms of um, elections and parliaments and, and so on. That's what I'm asking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm talking about the small P, which is, I think we'll always need uh, civic uh, change and civic leadership. And that's the place that I've found myself. And if that changes in the future, I'll, okay. I'll let you know. <laughs> there's a big smile there. We'll say no I more I don't know. I've no aspirations. Put it that way. Fair enough. Um, why did you make the move from... Dublin to Lynch, yourself and your wife. Yeah, uh, so I suppose my council of state term was coming to an end, which wasn't really anything to do with it, but it felt like things were changing in my life. Um, but we were also finding ourselves in um, the this, I don't know what we'll call it, we call it a housing crisis, we call it a rental crisis, but it's many things. Um, it It's really um, a humanitarian crisis in some ways where we have a, a very wealthy country, even though we still have, you know, 
poverty and inequality. We are a wealthy country and we have a situation now where there aren't enough places, at least decent and affordable places for people to live. And what that's led to is a massive squeeze and a massive um, wave of, I would say, greed, really. Um, And particularly in Dublin and particularly in the cities where rents have just got beyond ridiculous. So you're paying 20 grand a year in rent. And then you're supposed to put aside your couple of grand every month or, and, and develop this 20% deposit. And for us, particularly doing the work we do, my wife is in a similar area. She works in uh, mental health and music and meditation. And so she's a kind of a community health minded person mm. as well. So we're not high rollers working in a tech or the finance industry. And I've nothing against people working in tech and finance industry, but not everyone can or will work in those. We still need nurses. We still need teachers. We still need bin men. We need all all the ecosystem of different kinds of jobs. So we just felt uh, there was no future in Dublin for us. But aside from that, we also felt uh, a call to a more whole type of living where we were got to know our neighbours, where we were part of a more of a village life or a town life. And yeah. we're both from, she's from County Limerick, I'm from County Cavan. And we went on a road trip during the summer and um, we were in many different counties and we just found ourselves in Ennis Diamond and went for a walk and we were sitting, this sounds very, very hippy-dippy all together <laughs> now, but we were literally <laughs> took a rest on a walk. We were sitting under a tree and uh, up in that little bit of woodlands near the Falls Hotel and uh, we had the idea that, wow, this is an amazing part of the world and Susan has family there in um, Milton Malby and we've always come to Clare and um, many friends here and always loved it and just some sort of decision came over us and uh, you know it just felt right okay. and we thought well geez, well we rolled the dice and then we didn't know how we would do that but like everything in life you sometimes just roll the dice and then it happens. But if rent was more modest in Dublin you'd have stayed there? Uh, I think as I said like that was certainly a push factor but there were also pull factors and, and I think that it was a time in our life where we just wanted to make a big change Very and good. Claire called to us and said come on over we'll <laughs> give it a lash so uh, so far so good and uh, again the, the welcome has been a big part of that and I, I was chatting to my friend I'm, I'm a good friend with a famous Clare man Tony Griffin who, who was a um, great hurler obviously yeah, for Clare yeah. but I worked with Tony setting up helping him set up the Tor- Soar Foundation in the early days and um, I was asking him on the phone I said Tony are Clare people genuinely more friendly than other people <laughs> and he's well of course he's going to say yeah which he did <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I genuinely feel that cities, I, I'm a big fan of cities, I love all the stimulation, love all the buzz and all that, but I do think there's something about smaller places that can mm-hmm. keep that sense of community together and I get a lot from that. Sure. Um, you're great at buttering up the public, you're almost like a politician. Oh Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm only ribbing you now. Well, but yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not running, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I'm only winding up. No, but in all seriousness, um, when you talk with the housing and the rental crisis and, and just the homelessness that gets tied in with that as well, maybe just to finish and to tie both of our themes together, can what we talked about before and the way that you try to engender public support to force change, can that tackle an issue like that? That's arguably the biggest issue facing the country at the moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything that ever happened almost that was positive, whether it be a radio station being built or a school being built or a hospital being built or a football team being started, was started by a bunch of people that sat around a table and said, we should make that happen. And they made it happen. Mm. That's why we're in Clare FM. That's why people are at school. That's why people are in work. Because it's a, it's a group of people, a collective. Generally, there's one mad person at the start and quite sure. often they are a bit colourful or quirky or, you know... Uh, so if, if somebody has that inclination or a mad idea as some people it's not to dismiss that mad idea it's to actually give it some energy and ask for help and bring people around a kitchen table and I do believe that's where great change happens on mm. a small level then a bigger level and but, I think we can achieve one, that Yes, yeah, this th- one you need the leaders yeah we do and I think we saw that particularly with uh, for instance I know different people have different thoughts on it on the water charges for instance um, but you did see that how public pressure came to bear and it comes to bear on, on many different issues mm. and are we not very slow to do it as a country oh we are very slow yeah and I, I do think there's some reticence there and that's something to do around the confidence issue is that finding our voice sometimes it's not easy to speak out because you're afraid of upsetting the apple cart upsetting your uncle who's a county councillor or losing your job or someone thinking ill of you Mm -hmm. Um, but I say well damn it like speak out and get heard and rattle the cage because there are too many things in this country that need to change and we can't hold back 
Rory McKernan, it's been a pleasure. Enjoy life in Clare. And thanks for watching, John. Thanks very much. You're listening to a Clare FM podcast. Morning Focus broadcasts weekdays from 9am to 12 midday 